Well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for holding this important hearing. Uh, and thank you to the witnesses for your expert recommendations uh, to the committee. Ms. Wilkes, thank you so much for sharing your personal story. Um, my home state of Florida adopted a balanced billing law in 2016. And my understanding of the law is that, first and foremost, it works to protect the patient uh, and then establishes a process for the payer and the provider uh, to resolve a payment issue. So that if a patient receives care from a provider that is out of network, the patient will only be responsible for in-network cost sharing, and then providers and the insurance plans have to go through a state-arranged voluntary dispute resolution process where a penalty is assessed uh, to the party that refused to accept an offer that was close to the final arbitration order. And I understand that the negotiation is based on the usual and customary rate in that particular geographic area. Uh, and then it binds the parties going forward. Uh, Florida's law is relatively new, but I wanted to see if any of the witnesses have feedback on how my state is doing. Dr. Freeman, you practice in the state of Florida. What's your view? Uh, yes, thank you for the question, uh, Congresswoman Castor. Um, it, it's untested, frankly. Um, the history of, of balance billing in Florida and dispute resolution in Florida is not necessarily one that is uh, particularly good. And um, the previous, we ha we've had a balance billing ban for a long time for HMO products in Florida. And there was an attempt to, some time ago, to add PPO products to that. Um, the dispute resolution process that the state used turned out to be very insurer friendly and providers refused to use it after a while. Um, so this new law, has been tweaked, and we hope that it will be more provider friendly, and it will be one that both providers and insurers are happy to use. It has not been tested yet. I, I know that within the emergency medicine community, at least, uh, it is due to be tested very shortly, and we look forward to seeing the results of that experiment. So what will happen if, if the Pallone uh, uh, bill with uh, Mr. Walden passes? In my, in well, some of that my refers to the earlier question around federal preemption of state law. And we believe, first of all, that the, the federal law should apply if the state law does not have at least the same level of protections, certainly for patients, but also for the provider's system. We have to support our providers that are taking care of patients. Um, Ms. McAndrew, what, what's your view of the... the a dispute resolution process versus benchmarking. Thank you very much for your question, Congresswoman uh, Castor. Um, at Families USA, our preferred approach would be the benchmark approach. I think the um, initial reports on the CBO score um, of the various approaches were quite telling that the benchmark approach is um, produces the largest cost savings. And the cost savings that come from these various approaches um, trickle down to consumers. Our, the reason that we think this matters to consumers is that when we um, have any uh, surprise bill law that could potentially result in any inflationary costs within the system, those will trickle down to consumers in their premiums. So our goal is to have a payment rate that is as, as least inflationary as possible. Um, however, I will say, you know, at the end of the day, what matters most to us is the consumer protection part of this. And so while we prefer the benchmark rate, when it comes to discussing an arbitration system, the devil is in the details. Um, the bottom line for us is that bill charges should not be considered. So in how this. do we how do we ensure that what we do that to protect patients from surprise medical bills doesn't cause higher premiums? Well, I think that goes back to what's considered in the payment rate. So at the end of the day, whatever the system is, as long as it's not based on billed charges, I think that's what matters most. Because as some discussion has alluded to before, charges can be quite arbitrary. Sometimes I compare them to like the list price of a prescription drug. Nobody really pays it, as uh, Mr. Nichols said before. So we wouldn't want to bake it into our system. Does anyone else want to comment on uh, dispute resolution versus benchmarking? I, I, I would. So, you know, we have data in New York already as to how this has been proven. And the premium increase in New York has been actually very commiserate with the premium increase in California. So, you know, you have benchmarking in one area, you have dispute resolution in the other, and the premium increases have not been any different. But you have a decrease in New York 
from the standpoint of how many out-of-network providers you have from 20.1% down to 6.4%. Uh, uh, what I do want to emphasize, though, because cost has come up here several times. In, in New York, the average cost of a dispute resolution process is about $300. It takes an average of two weeks. It's all entered in electronically, and the resolution is adjudicated within those two weeks. It's a very seamless, quick, and easy process, and it has worked. What I would say also from the standpoint of benchmarking versus uh, dispute resolution is it is not a one-size-fits-all. My company invests a tremendous amount of resources to make sure that we do opioid-free anesthesia so that we don't have folks who are on opioids a year later after they've had surgery or that they don't have surgical side infections that have them to be readmitted back into the hospital after they've been discharged. Those actually decrease the cost of care. And as referenced earlier, we have insurance carriers who are willing to pay us a premium because they understand and they know that the I think overall you, cost of care uh, goes down. I think your time has uh, concluded. Thank you. Uh, doctor, I thank the gentlewoman uh, uh, yielding back.